two. You. So Dom, tell me, why do you do what you do? What's your mission? So I'm my mission's super ambitious. I want to be the world's best games designer. That's that's what I want to do. Nice saying it, you know. But uh, one step at a time. I'm willing to work as hard as hard as it is to get there. I love criticism and feedback. Anything that can help me make my art better, you know. And I look at it from an art perspective. You know, I don't want to make I don't want to make games that are that just appeal to the biggest audience or make the most money. I want to make games that are considered art and works of art that have messages behind them. And that's my goal. So Tom, what's the message behind Polygod? Um, Polygod is really about almost oppression, adversity, and uh, striving to you know achieve in the face of the most difficult odds ever. Oh. Our, our main character is disabled, first of all, only has one arm, and uh, the, the main character's goal is to become a god, so they're ascending from the lowest of the low, being a mortal, to trying to become a god. And it's incredibly difficult. The game is very hard to play, it's hard for the players, it's hard to the other characters in the story. So when the story begins, you're, you're with seven other characters, and most of them won't make it to the end because of how difficult it is, and to illustrate the challenge. And the story is really about, uh, you know, we, we want the players to project themselves onto the character. Uh -huh. That's why our main character is named Faceless the Blessed. So, and it's a, the character literally has no face, so you, you will project onto it. And it's, you know, it's really about, you know, the acquisition of, of power and strength through persistence and determination. It's an analogy for that, yeah. Oh, wow. And how, how did you grow by, like, creating these games and starting these companies? Um, I'd say that a lot of my growth has come from consuming other art and other mediums, from film to uh, books to philosophy to politics. And I find expanding yourself into all those different fields really helps enforce your art and what you do. And then you can start to say something with it, you know. And only now am I starting to go, okay, I'm, I'm trying to say things with, with the games and getting more articulate in how I want to speak to the players. And yeah. Sure. Yeah. No, sorry, that was deep. <laughs> and yeah, yo, I internalize that stuff. So basically, because you open your mind to such diverse fields, that all helps in creating your game. Yeah, one hundred percent. And that's obviously what makes your game different from others. Oh yeah, it might be obviously more narrow-minded. I, I I'd say we we've gone for a very unique art style. We've we've really our art style is actually inspired by um, a surrealist painter, Giorgio de Chirico. And uh, you can actually, if you go and look at, he does a lot of figures with, with, they lack faces. And that's where we got the idea for the main character. And we, we like the way he uses color. So we've really gone for very eclectic color palettes in the game. Strayed very much a, a, away from the mainstream games at the moment, which are very gray and brown. And they try to be realistic. And we said, no, realism's cool, but surrealism's cooler. <laughs> that's also going to be a quote. <laughs> so. What, what are your strengths? Like, what are the things that you're good at? I, mean, I remember when we spoke last time, we spoke about strengths finding. Yeah. So tell me your strengths. Yeah, I'd say um, specifically in games, uh, my biggest strength is systems design. So what I do is I build the code systems and then this is where interns and other people come in greatly as they can then populate the systems with objects. So for example, I created a system that lets us randomly generate levels. And then now I've got my assistant programmer, Wyndham, who comes in and he will design the individual rooms in the system. And then when we put that together, that creates a level that a player will then play. So what I do is these overarching systems and then we, we populate them with content. So you go in like the big picture. Yeah, mm. like big picture vision stuff. You makes know. sense, makes sense. Yeah. You only want to be the top game developer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what I do is I, I've actually got this right here. So I actually oh. keep a journal of ideas, nice. little little visual journal. So I, I start just by writing it down. What I when I I pl I'll, usually when I play a game and oh, then wait, I'll are think. Are you trying to take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's so I'll I'll write the ideas down and then what I'll do is I'll I'll do some sketches sometimes. I'll put some numbers down if it's an algorithmic thing that I'm thinking about. Tons of different ideas just get put in here and then I'll start playing around with them on Unity. Usually brainstorming quite rapidly and I'll. I'll do a lot of prototypes, so we'll do like five to ten prototypes that are each made in a day and then I'll see which of these five to ten games is fun to play and then if one of them is fun we'll maybe proceed with it. And uh, what happened with Polygod is it actually grew out of a mobile game that was supposed to play with dungeons uh, based on music, so the music would generate the levels. And we found that the game was super fun to play on the computer but not on mobile, oh. and then, and then, but it was top down so then we thought no we can do this in 3D. And then we took that and we made it 3D and then one thing led to another. So it's very organic and it's a, it's a step at, one step at a time. So I, I wouldn't say that I have the finished idea of the yes, game yes. in mind when I begin, 
but I have the idea of what I want to achieve from a technical standpoint. Oh, brilliant. So, so your process, you, you have your ideas, then you prototype and iterate until yeah. you see what works. Yeah. Instead of creating something that might not even work. Yeah, it, 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 it's very difficult to know what's going to be fun in advance because fun is something that's so subjective. So when it comes to creating mechanics, it's often looking at a bunch of abstract numbers and symbols on a piece of code and you go, how's this going to be fun? The only way you'll know is if you try. So we think let's maximize the amount of trying that we do, find something that's fun, and then once we know it's fun, then we put the effort into polishing it up, making it beautiful, making it easy, user-friendly, and, and a product. Oh, brilliant, that makes, just, that makes so much sense. So Luke Skywalker was mentored by Obi-Wan Kenobi. Do you have a mentor? I had a mentor, but he's straight to the dark side. <laughs> was he the pixel boy? No, no, um, I, I do actually have a mentor um, in, in game design. I'd say it's two, two mentors. Okay. Uh, I don't know them, but they are Japanese games designers, oh, wow. and it's through their work that has really inspired me. The one is Shigeru Miyamoto. He's actually the designer of the original Super Mario and the original Donkey Kong, oh, wow. and he's a genius. Yeah. And the other is Hideotaka Miyazaki, who did Dark Souls and that whole series of games recently, and he's just a genius. And I also think that Japanese games design is like far ahead of the West. Well, what makes it far ahead? I'd say that the way the designers, the, the approach to design, the philosophical approach to design in Japan is very different from, let's say, America's, especially when it comes to like mobile games. Uh, you know, I'd say one is a bit more profit orientated and the other is a bit more art orientated. And, uh, you know, the, the Japanese have focused on games as art for a long time now, but much longer than other countries. And that shows in their products. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that holds Nintendo back the most as a, as a Japanese com company is the fact that they only sell the games on their hardware. But their games are so brilliant that they actually end up selling most of the hardware, which is much more expensive than the games. So that's, that's how they make their money. Hmm. And what do you hope to achieve with your games? I hope to reach as big an audience as possible, you know, make as many people happy, have some, have some fun. Or maybe if uh, the game's a bit harder and they learn something, then that's good too. And, and do you have like a goal setting process? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say I set goals per project. So the goals have to be based realistically for the project. And uh, I've also got goals outside of the individual projects, like my long term goals. So I, I know where I'd like to be in the next five to ten years and I know I know where I want Polygot to be in the next five to ten months. So. And where is that going to be? Five to ten months? Released. <laughs> <laughs> On Xbox and PC. Yeah, so I remember you were showing me uh, Xbox, they sent you a kit or something. Yes, yes. Um, we actually have uh, signed with the ID at Xbox uh, Indie Development. So we're working with them. They sent us wow. the dev kits. We're going to be developing the game for Xbox One now. So that's their newest console. And uh, yeah, you'll be able to get it digitally through them. Guys, you'll be able to get it digitally through them. <laughs> and how, how did you end up speaking to Xbox? So we went to the Rage Expo, which is the largest gaming expo in Africa. It's the regional annual gaming expo. Uh, about 30,000 people go through the showgrounds uh, over the weekend. And Xbox were there. They were showcasing their new games. I think Gears of War released that weekend and there was a whole Gears of War stand there. And I, I went to the guys and I said, hey, how can I get my games on your system? They said, fill out this form send this to us, filled it out. Two weeks later, they said, we'd love to see Polygon on our platform. They checked out the game, they liked it, so. And did you, to a lot of game developers, they might be scared to go and ask Xbox? I mean, we, we actually asked them with Pixel Boy and they said no. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good sign for Polygon. Yeah, definitely. So if you can have dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Yeah, Jesus Christ, because we'd order tap water from the bar, turn it to wine and just have a party. Great time. <laughs> and if there's one, if there's one thing, if there's one, if there's one thing you could teach in the world, what would it be and why? Um, I, I'd say that I would teach people to question authority more often, because I find that through questioning, you know, if there is an answer to the question then the authority can make sense, you know, but if the answer is wrong, then the authority maybe doesn't make sense, and maybe needs to be questioned more. Mm -hmm. And I think just questioning doesn't do any harm. So, you know, just make people more inquisitive. And what are the skills needed to be an awesome game developer? 
Go skydiving. <laughs> yeah, no, Rami, Rami Ismail, he's an amazing games okay. designer, told me that. Uh, I met him um, at a maze in Johannesburg. He, he did a game called Ridiculous Fishing on, yeah. on iOS. It's an amazing game. And I uh, asked him, what, what makes a good game designer? What, what, do you, what, what, didn't, like, yeah. what do you do? And he said, go, go skydiving. And I said, what? And he said, new experiences. Oh. What you want to do is new experiences because you're creating things that are supposed to be fun. Go and do new fun experiences. It's going to inform your design. Sure. So yeah, what makes a good game designer? Skydiving. <laughs> nice. And so what are the skills that you obviously need to like build a game? Okay, so the, the, the actual skills, um, you, you, need to, you need to be very good at maths and programming and physics and art as well. This is actually when I was at UCT, I sure. studied uh, film as well as maths and games uh, because I needed to understand cinematography because we set up cameras and scenes all the time in games. And if you don't know what you're doing there, you're going to end up oh, misplacing wow. the cameras and that's going to look bad. And if it looks bad, the game's not going to feel oh. good. So, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot of different fields, I'd say. You've got to be a jack of all trades, a lot of random trades. And in terms of like, you know, math, science, is it basic math and science or do you have to like know your math and science? So I'll, I'll tell you what they told us. So when we walked into the UCT programming department, they said, unless you want to do the hardest programming courses, don't do games. Because sure. games at UCT is the only one that does C++. So it is very much the, it's probably the, the more advanced end of programming. Uh, what uh, what's the best programming platform to create in game? Uh, I'd say the language. The, uh, so I I love C Sharp just because it's incredibly powerful, um, but it's not that easy to learn. Uh, I'd say if you want to learn programming, Python's great. Java is also great. Um, and then Unity. Unity is great for making games specifically because they've created so many tools that you don't even have to program to do a lot of the basic stuff and start getting a hang of it. And you can actually create basic fun games in Unity without programming. And then maybe if you have something fun, you can learn how to program. So, so. if someone wanted to start pro um, programming or creating a game, they had no idea what to do, you'd recommend them to go to Unity? Yeah, for YouTube tutorials. <laughs> Download Unity YouTube tutorials. That's how I did it. <laughs> Everyone I've been interviewing, it's just yeah. like talking about I Google, learned nothing Google, at Google. nothing at university. And so what is the one skill that you could learn that could make it easier to learn the other skills? Uh, for games? Yeah. Uh, be good at maths. <laughs> you go like on Khan, Khan Academy. Yeah, no, just like brush up with the maths. There's a lot of lot of arithmetic and a lot of lot of maths going down. So would you say you'd have to like be maybe like wired naturally for like that kind of thinking and maths? Um, I, I don't think so. I think everything can be learned. So even maths, it just takes time. The problem with maths is it's incredibly boring and no one puts the time in. So if you're willing to just sit down and do sums five hours a day, you'll get really good at maths. <laughs> I promise you. That's more than everyone does ever. <laughs> Hey Head Start, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did watching myself. Again. The cameraman's like, what the heck is happening with you? But this always weird. Anyway, like, subscribe. If there was anything that blew your mind, please comment below. And if you want to watch the full episode as a podcast, then check out the links below. Oh.